Chapter 1 It was happening again. Michael watched dispassionately as the dark shadowy specter followed Christian Gaines around the conference room. It hovered, perhaps three feet off the ground, wandering after Gaines like a well-trained dog. Michael sighed and rubbed his eyes, but he knew that it wouldn't help. The specter would still be there, a dark, cloudy patch of fog disturbing him. It had been showing up for three weeks, distracting him. It was a nuisance. Michael's head pounded harder. He wondered if anyone else could hear the hundreds of miniature woodpeckers hammering away inside his head. He glanced at his Rolex. Noon. Only noon, and he had already used up all of his prescribed migraine medications. Gaines took Michael's glance at his watch as a signal to wrap up the meeting, and mercifully did so. Michael calmly watched as the cloudy black figure decided to follow John Pritchard out the glass doors along the corridor. Colin Ozit slapped Michael on the shoulder. Well, the FDA won't like it, but I'm sure our new director of the board will be able to smooth it all out. Michael gave a reserved smile. He had found throughout the years that a reserve and calm attitude made most people instinctively trust, respect, and admire him. He probably seemed much smarter than he was. The acquisition of Claymont Pharma is a good business decision for our company. While it may restrict the market further, Claymont has already decreased its presence there. I'm sure the FDA will agree that it is the best long-term solution. Ozit laughed obnoxiously. That's why you're the man for the job. Michael nodded. He gathered up the materials from the meeting and walked a short distance to his office. He was not the man for the job, Michael reflected. Max had been the man for the job. Max had been confident, inspiring, able to sweet-talk his way through anything. His youngest brother was perfect at lobbying to get exactly what the company wanted. Unfortunately, their father, David Ramsley, just recently retired, and Max hadn't seen eye to eye. To be fair, Max had been right. Now Max no longer worked with Ramsley Pharmaceuticals which meant the task fell to Michael. The claimant deal was Michael's first large test in the eyes of big business as the new head of the company. Either he would fail, and everyone would think that he had only received the position due to the fact that he was David's firstborn, or he would succeed and make his mark. He smoothed down his suit as he took a seat in his comfortable leather chair behind his mahogany desk. Anne had followed him into his office with a memo pad. She closed the door behind her, automatically getting a glass of water and putting down two of her own stash of over-the-counter pain medication on his desk with the glass. He looked at them for a moment, debating on telling her that they wouldn't put a dent into his migraine and that he was on far stronger medications. Of course, he didn't. He didn't tell anyone about the medications, or that he'd had a constant headache for the past six months, or that he was hallucinating black specters that floated behind people ominously. The only one he told was the doctor. Michael took the pills anyways and tried to focus on what Anne was saying. Gentlemen's Quarterly called again. They're still trying to get you for the cover. They promised to send over the interview questions before so that we can approve them. Absolutely not. Unlike his brother, Max, who had enjoyed being the center of attention, Michael did not. He much preferred his privacy. Same response for Business Weekly? Please. Anne tilted her head to the side and studied him for a moment. Business Weekly has been asking for years. With you now being the head of the company, it might be good press. No, thank you. Michael said softly but firmly. Chairing a conference was one thing. Working through meetings was okay. Even committee hearings he could do if he was well prepared. Going one-on-one -on -one with someone and knowing that every word you said would be recorded for posterity, with the expectations of delving into his personal life? No. Not possible. Besides, he had no personal life. He jogged the beach. He read extensively. He sailed. He worked twelve to eighteen hour days as he had done from the age of twenty at the family business. There was nothing else. Dr. Reynolds' office called. They have an opening today at one. There was a soft and unspoken query from his secretary with that statement. Anne was sharp, and she'd been with him for over twenty years. Twenty-two years, eight months, and nine days. But who was counting? Test results from Dad. He's on that cruise with Mom for the next four months, Michael lied. It was his own test results. He'd find out today if he was losing his mind. 
Unless there's something pressing, please confirm with Dr. Reynolds for one o'clock. No, there's nothing urgent. Anne paused for a moment and looked like she wanted to say something more. I'll set up the appointment. Anne, he asked, causing her to stop from exiting the office. Is there something else? I was going to talk to you about something, she said reluctantly. It can wait until the end of day. Are you sure? he asked. Yes, the end of the day would be better. Anne gave him a smile. You should eat something. I'll get you a sandwich and coffee sent up from the cafeteria. He nodded because it was easier than explaining that he didn't really want anything to eat. The pain in his head made his stomach nauseous. Or maybe it was the numerous drugs he was swallowing. He watched her return to her desk to make phone calls. When she tilted her head just so, the sunlight made it shine like burnished gold. He caught his breath a moment, watching her through the glass. She really was beautiful. He ought to stop staring, mooning after her. It wasn't professional. Of course, he'd been doing it for twenty years, so it was a natural response, like breathing the air or drinking water. Twenty-two years, eight months, and nine days, his mind corrected him. Michael stared down at the briefing from the Claymont deal. The words blurred, and he blinked hard to bring them back into focus. He grabbed a legal pad and jotted down some notes to try to win the FDA over. At some point, the coffee and sandwich arrived. He managed the coffee and half the sandwich. It was all he could stomach. Anne knocked on his door, poking her head in. The car has arrived. Seven months ago, he had come to the decision to use a company car and driver to go everywhere. With the pain from the headaches, it made sense. His own beamer sat useless in the parking garage of the downtown condo. People from the company had probably thought it had more to do with his position, but he actually preferred to drive himself. He just no longer trusted himself to. Twenty minutes later, he was escorted through the waiting room of Dr. Reynolds' office. He was directed to sit in the doctor's personal office and wait perhaps a minute before Dr. Reynolds joined him. Michael was surprised when the old man who had been treating him for years sat down in the seat next to him rather than in his usual chair across the desk. They shook hands in greeting. "'I'm afraid I have some bad news for you, Michael,' Dr. Reynolds said gravely. Michael had known it was going to be bad. People didn't generally hallucinate and find out it was good news. He waited patiently for the doctor explained. "'There's a mass behind your right eye. It explains some of the migraines, the occasional blurred vision, and the hallucinations which are actually vision impairment caused by the pressure of the mass. It is small. I will need to biopsy it to determine if it is cancer.' It explains some of the migraines. Not all, Michael asked, picking up on what the doctor hadn't said. No. There was pity in the doctor's eyes. Michael, there is a second growth. It is much larger, and is pressing against a very delicate area of your brain. It is a miracle that you have not had an aneurysm or stroke yet. If you did, the results would be catastrophic. By all medical accounts, you should be dead. Michael absorbed the news. It wasn't good, but surely with modern science and medicine, something could be done. What are the next steps? Chemotherapy? No, Dr. Reynolds sighed. Even with the radiation, the mass would shrink too slowly. You could have a stroke at any moment. Dr. Hemond and I believe that you may have as little as two months before the pressure becomes too much for your brain. There's too much risk that you will die before the mass is shrunk enough to ease the pressure. Surgery is your only option. It's not without risks. When? Michael got straight to the point. As in business, cutting everything down to the facts was essential. Becoming emotional had never served any purpose. Normally a surgeon will schedule seven to eight months from now. You do not have that time. I am going to recommend Dr. Hemond. He's a very good brain surgeon, and he has a cancellation in three days. I urge you to take it. If you do not, you will have to find another surgeon, or you will die. Michael felt numb. I expect other surgeons would be booked as well. They are. Dr. Reynolds put a hand on Michael's arm gently. Michael, there is a very good chance you will not survive the surgery. If you do, there will be damage to the brain. What are the odds of surviving this sort of surgery? The numbness was being replaced with a gnawing panic, but Michael didn't show it. He was a master of calmness, no matter the turmoil he might feel inside. What sort of damage? One in two patients survive. The doctor waited for that to sink in. If I don't have the surgery, I will die. 
If I do have the surgery, there's a fifty percent chance I will die. Michael repeated his earlier question. What sort of brain damage? Dr. Reynolds took out a sheet showing one of the many scans that Michael had undergone. This is the small mass. Dr. Hemmen can carefully remove your eye and then remove the mass, reinserting the eye without any problems to your vision. That is the easy procedure. It didn't sound easy. Michael's stomach rebelled. He liked his eyes and preferred to keep them inside his head. He didn't particularly care how skilled the surgeon might be. Dr. Reynolds pulled another scan from the bottom of the file folder and placed it on top. This is the larger mass. We need to approach it where there will be the least consequences to your daily living. Essentially, he is choosing what brain damage to give you. By removing a part of your skull here and coming through this area of the brain, we would affect the area of your brain that deals with language. After the surgery, it is very likely that you would have a condition called speech aphasia. While you'll be able to understand everything spoken, you might have trouble replying. You might forget a word. You might mean to say a word like fork, but insert onion instead. You will not be able to read or write. The words and letters will get mixed up. It will be a permanent condition. How likely is this brain damage to occur? Michael felt like he had been punched. To never speak properly, write, or read again? It would be almost certain. But there is a chance that it wouldn't happen. He had to ask. Michael, I would not count on it. Dr. Reynolds shut the file. This is the best chance that you have to live. I'm going to schedule the surgery. I would respectfully suggest that you update your will and see to any unfinished business in the next three days. If you survive the surgery, we can biopsy the removed masses and find out if it is cancer. We will proceed from there. Please, go to exam room one and the nurse will take you through the pre-op forms and liability forms. Michael nodded and swallowed thickly. Dr. Reynolds squeezed his shoulder. I will do everything I can to get you through this. In the meanwhile, I am going to up your dosage for the pain medication that you are currently on to help with the migraines. Michael shook the doctor's proffered hand, then proceeded to exam room one. The nurse walked him through the paperwork. He agreed not to hold the doctor or the hospital responsible for anything that might occur during the surgery, including death. He received paperwork detailing his aftercare and what to expect. His head would be shaved at the hospital for the surgery. No food or water after midnight, the day of the surgery. He would remain in hospital for a minimum of three days, perhaps more, depending on how things progressed. He was given a prescription for the medication increase and told not to drive or operate heavy machinery. Today was Monday. Surgery was scheduled for Thursday. He's going to be at the hospital at seven in the morning. How is he going to deal with the claimant acquisition? What about the other legal issues he had sitting on his desk? Who would take over his work? Moreover, who would take his place as head of the company? Michael did everything on automatic. He listened politely to the nurse, nodded in all the right places, signed his name where he was supposed to. He took his paperwork, folding it. He placed it in the inside breast pocket of his suit. He didn't need anyone knowing about this. Not just yet. He thanked her for her time and was silent as usual on the drive back to corporate headquarters. He pretended to be checking emails on his phone. However, the truth was, he didn't even see the screen. Going through emails was pointless. He couldn't concentrate. It was 4.31 when Michael came back to his office. He knew this because he grabbed his current journal, wrote down the time and date, and then wrote down his prognosis. It seemed so permanent when written down in his script. Michael had kept a journal since the age of eight. For a moment he sat, staring at the words. Then he began a list of things that needed to be done. He would have to adjust his will. Ethan and Evan, his new nephews from his brother Noah and wife Elle, hadn't been alive when he had made the last will. He'd like to leave something in trust for them, should the worst happen. Then there were instructions for the Claymont deal. He'd have to get the legal team up here to finish what was necessary, and leave everything in order to make it easier for his replacement. There should be instructions given for the Kellington court case. They should settle out of court and out of the press. It would be the best scenario. As for his own replacement, perhaps Deagle for the head of the legal department and Gaines for the head of the company. Noah wouldn't be interested. Max was no longer with the company in any meaningful way. Gaines would be the best candidate. He was trustworthy. He knew the vision the company had for the future. Michael was interrupted as Anne knocked on the glass and entered his office, shutting the door firmly behind her. 
Michael, I thought we should talk. Now was not the best time. He continued to write furiously. Could you ask Deagle to come here? Tell him to bring Sanders and... What is the other assistant's name? Walkers. Yes, Walkers. Please tell them to come. Michael, I need to talk to you about something important. Anne came forward and sat across from him. I've worked here for a long time, and I've decided to make some changes in my life. Twenty-two years, eight months, and nine days. He laid down his pen and waited to see what she would say, impatient to get to work, but taking the time to listen to her. Instead, she took a deep breath and handed him a paper. What is this? But he knew. The first few words gave it away. It was a letter of resignation. He looked at her with some confusion. Anne, why? Are you unhappy here? I've loved working with you, she explained. You are an amazing boss. You've taught me everything I know in the business world. But I can't keep doing twelve to eighteen hour days, chasing you around, making your world easier for you. We could reduce your hours, he offered. If you need more vacation time or anything else, you need only ask. It's not about working less hours or vacation. I want... Anne stared at her clasped hands that rested on her knees. I want some things that I can't have if I continue to work here with you. I don't understand. I'm forty years old. I want a family. I want to go to PTA meetings, school plays, soccer, or gymnastics, or whatever sport my events my kids might choose. Michael felt a flare of panic but tried to stamp it down. His Anne hadn't dated anyone seriously since that Roy character. He was certain she wasn't dating anyone right now. Was she? The company has a great maternity program and daycare. You're not understanding me. Then help me to understand. He rose from his chair, coming around the desk, stopping when she stood as well. Anything I can do to help. Anything I can give you, I will. There was a slight hitch in her voice. Can you give me babies? Michael stared dumbfounded at her. What could he say? A voice inside his head jumped up and down, screaming yes. The sane part of him said he would likely be dead in three days. Why on earth was she asking this, and what exactly did she mean? There was disappointment in her eyes and her voice. I thought not. He didn't know what he'd done, or not done, or what he should do. She turned and briskly walked to her desk, grabbing her purse. Galvanized into action, he followed her. Anne, please wait. She kept walking, and he continued to dog her steps. Please stay. I need you here. She gave an odd sort of little sound. We can talk about this, he said. He wasn't sure how, but he was willing to. Anything for her to stay. Please, Anne. She walked into the elevator and pressed a button. The doors began to close. He put his hand out to stop them. Please stay. She looked at him for a moment, then pressed the button again. As the doors closed, she said, Goodbye, Michael. He stood staring at the elevator for a moment like the idiot he was. A hand clamped onto his shoulder. Trouble in paradise, Ramsley? It was Colin Ozit. Michael didn't care for Ozit under normal circumstances. He liked him far less right now. There had always been a bit of a rumor going around that Michael and Anne were romantically involved. There was, disappointingly, no truth to that rumor, but it didn't stop people from talking. He looked Ozit straight in the eye and lied. Everything's fine. Ozit chuckled. Sure thing. Michael walked around the odious man and went directly to Jeanie Duvel. Mrs. Duvel was secretary to Christian Gaines. She was a competent woman. Mrs. Duvel, I apologize for interrupting, but I find myself in a situation. Mrs. Duvel looked up from her filing. Oh? Anne's gone home for the day. She's had a bit of a family emergency and is likely to be away for a while. Michael lied again. He did so very convincingly, for a man who rarely ever did lie. I was wondering if you could call the temp agency and ask them to send someone over tonight. Tonight, Mr. Ramsley? she asked, surprised. Yes. Actually, please tell them to send three people. Michael revised his order. Do you happen to know Deagle's extension number? 332. She grabbed her address roster and looked for the temp agency. I'll get that done right away, Mr. Ramsley. Thank you, Mrs. DeVell. I appreciate it. Michael returned to his office and called Deagle. It was nearly the end of day, and unfair to ask the legal department to keep working, but it was necessary. He needed to ensure that things were finished before his surgery. Of course, he didn't tell Deagle this. 
he simply quietly insisted that Deagle and his team come to the nearby boardroom. He was the head of the company, and they complied. Michael looked at his journal. With a few strokes, he noted the time. Anne has quit. I am drowning. He closed the book and shelved it. Grabbing all of the necessary files, he headed toward the conference room. Michael Ramsley was an idiot. A brilliant lawyer and businessman, but an idiot nonetheless. Anne slid into the booth and kicked off her heels. She pulled the clip out of her hair and massaged her head. The waiter came, and she ordered a strawberry daiquiri to start. Ten minutes later, Elle slid into the booth. Elle's dark form beauty was a foil for Anne's fair blondness. They'd become friends shortly before Elle had become engaged to Noah, Michael's brother. Now Elle and Noah were married with twin boys. It was the birth of Elle's babies that had really started the regret and thinking into motion for Anne. She dedicated most of her life to Ramsley Pharmaceuticals, and one Ramsley in particular. Michael was tall, lean, had black hair that was starting to gray at the temples. He was quiet, but had a sense of humor. She'd loved him since she was seventeen and saw him speak at a conference she was crashing. She was supposed to be working as part of the wait staff for the conference across the hall. Ten years older than her, Michael had been poised and elegant in his speech about the company. It was a meeting of shareholders, and he had simply been wonderful. Afterward, she'd managed to think up what she thought was a very good question and approached him. He'd been patient and kind. She cringed now to think of it. She'd known nothing about business or big pharma. Her question had been silly. Michael hadn't treated it as such, though, and for the first time in her life she'd felt worthy of someone's attention. That was when she decided she was going to figure out a way to make him hers. Three weeks later, and with the extensive ridge search, she'd found out that Ramsey Farva was hiring a secretary for one of the legal staff. It was Michael. She'd borrowed a suit from one of her former teachers, brushed up on her resume, polished her interview answers, and charged forward like the teenager that she was, knowing that she just had to get the job. The interview hadn't gone well. It was conducted by an old lady going into retirement and deciding on her replacement. It was obvious that Anne had no experience. As she was walking down the hall, dejected from the episode, she'd run into Michael. Bolstering up her courage, she'd greeted him by name. He'd been startled to see her, but actually remembered who she was, and that was all that Anne needed as encouragement to say how much she wanted the available job. She'd run her pitch until she was out of breath, and then waited on tender hooks until he'd simply said she was hired. The previous secretary had protested, but Michael had quietly stated that while a secretary could be taught the necessary skills to do the required job, ambition and loyalty couldn't be taught. Anne seemed to have both. After that, Anne had done everything she could to prove that she was the secretary that he needed. She'd done a good job after she'd mastered the basics. She'd also tried to flirt, showed a little too much leg, and finally had asked him out. He'd replied by gently telling her about the harassment policy. She'd slunk away and been a very proficient secretary after that. She would make him proud of her by being the best secretary that the company had ever seen. She felt like she'd accomplished that. Over the years, they had become friends. He'd escorted her to company events, allowing her to be his plus one. She'd gotten to dress up, socialize, and even dance with him. It had been like Cinderella. However, just like Cinderella, the ball ended, and the next day was back to work. She had been professional. It was hard sometimes, because every year she'd fallen more in love with him. His touch could soothe or thrill depending on the moment. His rare smile made her melt. It was hopeless. She wasn't sure he wasn't asexual and had no sex drive at all. He kept his private life incredibly private. Anne had tried to make him jealous by dating others, yet he hadn't reacted. She sighed heavily. Today it was all over. Today she started to take back her life and hopefully have the family she'd always wanted. Only it wouldn't be with Michael. It went that bad? Ella asked. She signaled the waiter and ordered a lime margarita. He's clueless, Anne flushed. I said something really stupid. What? El asked gently. He asked if there was anything he could do, and I asked him if he could give me babies. You should have seen the look of shock on his face. What did he say? El leaned in. Nothing, Anne shrugged miserably. He said nothing. Did you tell him how you feel? 
It has to be an idiot not to know. Anne gulped down some of her slushy goodness. There's been a rumor going around the company for years that we've been having an affair. He's never even kissed me. He's the perfect gentleman. You say that like it's a curse. Elle thanked the waiter for her drink, and Anne ordered another one before the waiter could get away. Maybe you should slow down. I wish, just once, that company didn't have glass offices everywhere. I wish he would just have ripped off my clothes like in one of those steamy, trashy romance novels. Fifty Shades of Ramsley Corporate. Anne sighed and stirred her drink with a straw. I can't believe I've wasted twenty years. I'm forty. What if I have no good eggs left? What if I can't get pregnant? What if there are complications because I've left it for so long? What if I never want to have anyone's babies but Michael's? Those are a lot of questions, and I don't think you need to answer them all tonight. Elle grabbed a menu. Why don't we order something before you manage to get yourself stinking drunk? Jeanie slid into the booth. Sorry I'm late. I was very sorry to find out you had a personal family emergency, Anne. What? Anne looked at her in confusion. That's what Mr. Ramsley said. That you left early and wouldn't likely be in for a few days because you had a family emergency. Jeanie tried to flag down a waiter, but was unsuccessful. There is no family emergency. You know that, and I know that, but Mr. Ramsley didn't know that I knew you were resigning. I think he's going to try to sweet-talk you into coming back. This time Jeanie managed to get the waiter's attention. Three shots of Tennessee whiskey plus two glasses of your best lager. Elle and Anne stared at her. What? I thought we were getting smashed tonight. Anne just did the hardest thing a woman could ever do. She broke up with the guy who doesn't even know she loves him. Jeanie gave them an innocent look. She is one of the most professional secretaries in the firm, but once she was off the clock, Jeanie was a firecracker, something which very few people in the firm knew. Although, if he does come around begging you to come back, maybe you could ask him for passionate sex in exchange for returning to your job? Anne rolled her eyes. He's not going to go for that. At least ask him to be your baby, Daddy. You can get his squirmies in a cup down at the clinic and get them to inseminate you. Jeanie! Anne laughed, then sobered and wiped away a tear. I hope those shots of whiskey aren't for me. I can't stand hard liquor. Don't you worry. They're for me. My mama taught me how to drink. I can see I'm going to have to be the sensible one here. Al reached over and squeezed Anne's hand. If there's anything no one I can do for you, let me know. Thank you, but I don't see that there's anything anyone can do. Anne sighed. He's simply oblivious. The waiter returned with a tray, and Anne's second daiquiri joined her first. Jeanie lined up her assortment of glasses, and they ordered appetizers. When the waiter left, Jeanie volunteered. I have a cousin. His name is Orville, but don't worry, nobody calls him that. We call him Magnum. He looks like Tom Selleck did in Magnum P.I. Anyhow, his girlfriend Judy left him, and if you'd like, I could set you up. No, please, no setups or blind dates yet, Anne protested. I'm not ready. You're the one who said her eggs aren't getting younger, Jeanie pointed out. He's a firefighter. Or, if you'd prefer, there's Holden. He's a detective for the police force. His wife, Dee Dee, died of cancer a couple years back. He's got three children, two girls and a boy, so you'd have a ready-made family. Can I just mourn the unrealistic dream that I had of being with Michael before we discussed new men? Anne asked. Absolutely, Elle raised her drink. To Anne, and starting over. They all raised their glasses to that. By the end of the evening, Elle made sure that Jeanie and Anne got home safely. As she walked the very drunk Anne through her apartment to bed, Anne lamented mournfully, Did you know there's a rumor going around the office that we're having an affair? It's been going around for years. No one mentioned something about it. So did you earlier at the bar. Here we are. Sit down. Elle pulled off Anne's shoes and tipped her back onto the bed. You should get some sleep. He's never even kissed me. Anne groaned. Anne also groaned in the morning when daylight blinded her. Elle had left two pain pills and a bottle of water on the nightstand. Anne rummaged on the floor for her purse and pulled out her phone. There were no messages from Michael. She pressed a pillow over her head to drown out the light. Her head hurt. Thank you for listening.
If you enjoyed this chapter, please look for the next chapter of Words Unspoken. Also, please like this video. This is free for you and would really help grow my audience with the algorithms. Thank you.